Hello and welcome back to Linear Algebra, the video course where we talk about matrices and in particular about determinants of matrices. Indeed, in today's part 44, we will check out what the determinant is in the two-dimensional case. We already mentioned that in general the determinant can calculate the volume of a parallel epipet. And in two dimensions everything is much easier because we just have a parallelogram. Moreover, we already know what to do to calculate the area of such a parallelogram. However, before we discuss the details, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. As always, don't forget to download the PDF version and the quiz for this video with the link in the description. Now today, we will finally define the determinant for a matrix A. However, we first will do that for a 2 times 2 matrix. And in order to motivate this definition, we will first look at a system of linear equations. And you know, usually we write this as ax is equal to b. Hence, in this case, we have a two-dimensional vector x and a two-dimensional vector b. Moreover, you also know we can shorten that with a matrix notation where we have a right-hand side. So there we have b and on the left-hand side we have the entries of the matrix A. So we have a11, a12, a21 and a22. And at this point you already know we can simply use the Gaussian elimination to solve this system of linear equations. However, in order to make this work, let's assume that our first entry here is non-zero. In other words, we just restrict which matrices A we can choose here. And then we already know A11 is our first pivot and we can eliminate this element here in the first step of the Gaussian elimination. And this one we can simply describe as take the second row and subtract a21 divided by a11 times the first row. So you know, this is how it works. We don't change the first row, but we change the second row. And we do that in such a way that we get a zero here. And now we just have to calculate to see what we get for the other entries. So you see, it's not so complicated. We multiply this factor with this entry and then we subtract it from a22. And very similarly, we get it for the right hand side. And at this point, the Gaussian elimination is already finished because we have our row echelon form here. So for a two dimensional system, it's very quick. However, for our general end result here, I don't like the fractions we have. Therefore, I will multiply our new second row here by the factor a11. Since this is a non zero element, the whole thing is an allowed row operation. And then what we get is something that is much nicer to read. It's a11 times a22 minus a21 times a12. Moreover, we get a similar thing on the right hand side. However, we are not so interested in the right hand side after all. The important thing is now our row echelon form on the left hand side. There, by assumption, we already know that we have one pivot here. And now the question is, do we also have a pivot here one step below? And now of course, by definition, this is a pivot exactly when it's non-zero. In other words, that this entry is not zero is equivalent to the fact that we have two pivots. And there we have learned in the last videos that this means that we have a unique solution for the system of linear equations. Please note, here we have a square matrix, so this is if and only if, no matter what the right hand side is. So you see, here we have a number which tells us immediately if we have a unique solution of the system of linear equations. Therefore, this number is very important and we will call it the determinant of the matrix. As a comment, please note the assumption at the beginning was not really a restriction for the end result here. For example, we would also get that if we assume that a21 is non-zero, because then we just have to do a row exchange. For this reason, the number here is important for all 2 times 2 matrices A. Therefore, we will formulate the definition exactly in this sense, so we choose a general 2 times 2 matrix A. And then this number here is called the determinant of A. 
And usually we use this short notation here to represent the real number. And please recall, it's given by a11 times a22 minus a12 times a21. Indeed, it's very easy to remember because you multiply the diagonal and add a plus sign in front of it. And then you multiply the turned diagonal here and put a minus sign in front of it. And then both things together gives us our determinant of a. In fact, I would say this is something you should never forget. This is how you can calculate the determinant in two dimensions. Okay, and now you see the determinant of a matrix determines if a system of linear equations is uniquely solvable. You just have to check if the determinant is zero or not. So now we can remember the determinant helps for systems of linear equations. But we already know the determinant can do much more. Namely, as we have discussed it in the last video, the determinant should be able to calculate volumes. However, volume here is used as a general concept and only in three dimensions it would coincide with the common volume. Therefore, to avoid confusion, I would usually put an n to the volume function depending in which dimension n we calculate everything. Hence, now the question would be, if we are in two dimensions, what is the two-dimensional volume? For this, just imagine that you are not a three-dimensional person, but very flat. So if you lived in a two-dimensional space R2, everything would be flat and the areas of figures would act as your new volume. Therefore, in R2, the volume function calculates areas. So now imagine we have two vectors u and v in R2, then we know they span a parallelogram. So this is not new, we could have u here and v there, and then we see the parallelogram. Moreover, it has a well-defined area. And exactly this area, the volume function should measure. Hence, we can simply define the volume function of two vectors should be simply the area of the parallelogram. However, you might already know, we also want to bring in a sign for this volume function. Therefore, we would say it's the orientated area of the parallelogram. This means the area could also be negative if we have a negative orientation. Therefore, at this point you should ask, how is the orientation defined? So this means we have to define in which case we take the plus sign and in which case we take the minus sign. Indeed, it's not complicated at all. With a picture, it's easy to explain. So we have the two vectors, u and v, that lie in R2. And now, in our imagination, we just rotate u such that the angle between v gets smaller. And now, if this rotation is in a mathematical positive sense, we have a plus sign. And please note, here it's important that u is the first entry for the volume function. Hence, the opposite picture would be that we have to rotate u in a negative sense. So we still rotate u and we want to make the angle smaller. Hence, in this example, it goes clockwise, so in the negative sense. And that's all. This is how we define orientation for two vectors in R2. And with that, we can give the area of the parallelogram an additional sign. And with that, we have a so-called orientated two-dimensional volume. However, at this point, you might say that we have already seen this orientated area of a parallelogram. And indeed, we discussed that in part 10 when we talked about the cross product in R3. And exactly this we can use now to calculate this two-dimensional volume. The only problem we have is that the cross product is only defined in R3. However, this is not a big problem because we can simply embed R2 into R3. For example, you could see R2 as the xy plane in R3. This means for the vector u above, we can define a new vector u tilde. And it has the same components as u for the first and second component, but zero for the third component. And of course, the same we can do with v. So we have v1, v2, and then zero. So the pictures of the vectors would look the same, but now there is an additional third axis. 
So this means now we are able to use the cross product defined in R3. And of course we have to use it for U tilde and V tilde and then we know that we get the area of the parallelogram by the length of the result of the cross product. In other words, we have to calculate the Euclidean norm of the result u tilde times v tilde. Now, at this point, you can check out part 10 again if you want to know how to calculate the cross product. Here, I just give you the result. It's 0, 0, and then u1 times v2 minus v1 times u2. And then you see the Euclidean norm here is not hard to calculate. It's just the absolute value of the last entry simply because all the other ones are exactly zero. So there we have it, this is the result. The area of the parallelogram is given by this number. And there you might already see, without the absolute value, this is exactly the determinant of a matrix. Namely, it's a determinant of the matrix that has u and v as columns. So indeed, we mean the two times two matrix here. So you see, this is exactly the calculation rule we discussed above. Moreover, now you should see, if we ignore the absolute value, we indeed get our orientated area. In other words, now we see the determinant is exactly our two-dimensional volume function. So this is definitely a result we should write down. So you could say, this is the main result of the video today. The two-dimensional volume function is described by the determinant function. We just have to write the vectors in the columns of a matrix. So in other words, now you can remember the determinant is exactly the volume function. And indeed, we could prove that by using what we already know from the cross product in R3. And now of course, the question is, how can we generalize that to the n-dimensional case? And exactly this is what we will do in the next video. So I hope I see you there and have a nice day. Bye.